Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I am Dr. Amna Sajay from the Department of Biochemistry and today we are going to start from where we left off. In the previous lecture we discussed the biomedical importance of different types of carbohydrates. We covered till glycogen. Today we are going to start from starch. Now starch is also a homopolymer comprising of glucose subunits or in other words it is a homopolysaccharide comprising of glucose monomers that are linked together via glycosidic bonds. Now starch unlike glycogen is a polysaccharide of plant origin. It is synthesized in the green leaves of plants from excess glucose and serves as a reserve food supply in plants. It is not only stored in green parts of the plants but it is also stored in tuberous parts of the plant such as in potatoes and in seeds of different plants such as corn, wheat and rice. So in everyday life we are consuming starch in a variety of foods such as potatoes, wheat, rice, corn, etc. So this dietary starch undergoes enzymatic degradation in our digestive tract and as a result of this degradation it is converted into its constituent glucose monomers and these glucose monomers or molecules can then be used by the cells for energy production and for other purposes. Okay, an interesting point about the structure of starch is that it consists of two types of molecules. One is the linear type of molecule which is known as amylose and the other is the branched molecule which is known as amylopectin. Now, in the linear arrangement of glucose molecules, the type of glycosidic bond is known as alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkage because it is being formed between carbon number 1 of one glucose monomer and carbon number 4 of the adjacent glucose monomer. Whereas in amylopectin there are two types of glycosidic linkages present. One is the alpha 1 4 uh, glycosidic linkage in the linear arrangement of molecules. But when, wherever there is a branch point like here, here and here, the glycosidic linkage will be alpha 1, 6 glycosidic linkage that is glycosidic bond will be formed between carbon number 1 of one glucose molecule and carbon number 6 of the other glucose molecule. But in the linear arrangement of molecules, when there is no branch point present, the glycosidic linkage will be the same as in amylose that would be alpha 1, 4 linkage. Now this figure shows a branch point. This is a glucose monomer at the branch point which is forming a bond with the adjacent glucose molecule and this bond is being formed between carbon number 6 of this glucose monomer and carbon number 1 of this glucose monomer giving rise to the glycosidic linkage known as alpha 1 6 glycosidic linkage but this type of linkage is only present at branch points and not in the linear arrangement of molecules. Now this similar type of branch points are present in glycogen because glycogen is also a branch polymer of glucose. So glycogen structure is quite similar to amylopectin with regards to branch points. Now, now we move on to cellulose. Cellulose is another example of homopolysaccharide of glucose and it is also found in plants. It is not present in animals. Now cellulose is a polysaccharide. It is an unbranched linear polysaccharide consisting of several hundreds to many thousands glucose subunits. Cellulose is the most abundant organic polymer on earth as it can be found in cell walls of green plants, it can be found in algae, it can even be found in bacteria. And 90% of cotton fiber and about 50% of wood is also made up of cellulose. So it is a very abundantly found 
organic polymer on earth. Now the enzymatic machinery which is required for degradation of cellulose is not present in the digestive tract of humans. So any dietary cellulose that we are consuming cannot be hydrolyzed in our digestive tract. Instead cellulose remains in the digestive tract as such and it absorbs water as a result of which the bulk of stool increases and the time it takes the food to move through the digestive tract is decreased. So dietary cellulose in case of humans is not being degraded, instead it is acting as a dietary fiber which is an important component of balanced diet. Now we move on to heteropolysaccharides. Now what is the difference between homopolysaccharides and heteropolysaccharides? Homopolysaccharides are composed of same type of monomers whereas in heteropolysaccharides the constituent subunits are different. They are not the same. For example starch. In starch we can only found, find glucose molecules. In glycogen we only find glucose mo monomers. In cellulose we only find glucose monomers but in case of heteropolysaccharides different types of constituent subunits are present. Now important heteropolysaccharides in the human body are known as glycosaminoglycans or GAGs. Now these GAGs are composed of a repeating disaccharide unit consisting of an amino sugar and an acidic sugar. So the constituent the constituents of het uh, gags in humans are amino sugars and acidic sugars and they are not the same that is why the polysaccharides are termed as heteropolysaccharides. Now this figure shows chondroitin sulfate which is a glycosaminoglycan found in humans and it is composed of two different type of subunits an acidic sugar and an amino sugar. It is called an acidic sugar because it is a carboxylic acid and it is known as an amino sugar because it contains amino group. This is known as glucuronic acid which is the acidic sugar component of chondroitin sulfate and this is an acetyl galactosamine which is the amino sugar co uh, component of chondroitin sulfate and together they form a glycosidic linkage and form a disaccharide unit and this disaccharide unit is repeating in the structure of chondroitin sulfate. And this is the hallmark of glycosaminoglycans. They are composed of repeating disaccharide units and they, these disaccharide units are composed of an acidic sugar and an amino sugar. Now this is another example of glycosaminoglycan known as hyaluronic acid. In hyaluronic acid the disaccharide repeating unit is composed of N-acetyl glucosamine which is the amino sugar component and glucuronic acid which is the acidic sugar component and this disaccharide unit repeats over and over in the structure of hyaluronic acid. Now it is important to remember that glycosaminoglycans in our body are present in combination with proteins forming compounds known as proteoglycans. We will discuss proteoglycans in further detail in later lectures but this is just to apprise you of the fact that glycosaminoglycans are components of compounds known as proteoglycans and in proteoglycans only f about 5% of the structure is being contributed by protein whereas 95% of the structure is being contributed by the glycosaminoglycans which is the carbohydrate component of these compounds and these glycosaminoglycans are basically heteropolysaccharides comprising of a repeating disaccharide unit. Now as you can see uh, in proteoglycans there is a brush border like appearance. This is the core protein to which the molecules of glycosaminoglycans are linked and this arrangement 
of molecules give rise to the brush border appearance in proteoglycans and again we will discuss the structure of proteoglycans in detail in subsequent lectures now these glycosaminoglycans perform varied functions in our body and their function result from the fact that they are highly negatively charged molecules due to the presence of sulfate groups present in glycosaminoglycans and because of their highly negative nature they can bind water molecules and uh, along with water molecules they form a gel like matrix which is an important part of the ground substance in the extracellular matrix in addition to forming gel like matrix these uh, glycosaminoglycans also possess lubricant properties because of which they serve as lubricants in joints they are also important components of mucus secretions in the gastrointestinal tract and the genitourinary tract where they are Uh, performing a protective function now heparin is also an example of glycosaminoglycan and heparin as you might know is a very important blood anticoagulant now we move on to the classification of carbohydrates now carbohydrates can be classified on the basis of complexity and on the basis of their reducing properties First of all we will classify uh, carbohydrates on the basis of their complexity and as we have discussed this scheme before i will only briefly explain today okay carbohydrates can be classified into monosaccharides disaccharides oligosaccharides and polysaccharides now monosaccharides are the simplest sugars and they cannot be further hydrolyzed into a simpler sugar they can contain 3 to 7 carbon atoms and they can be further divided into l doses and ketoses depending upon the type of functional group present in their structure if an aldehyde functional group is present then the sugar will be termed as aldose if a keto functional group is present then the sugar will be termed as a ketose okay now monosaccharides can also be classified depending upon the number of carbon atoms present in their structure for example three carbon containing monosaccharide will be termed as triose four carbon containing monosaccharide will would be a tetrose five carbon containing monosaccharide would be a pentose six carbon containing monosaccharide would be a hexose and seven carbon containing monosaccharide would be a heptose now disaccharides disaccharides are also simple sugars but they can be further hydrolyzed into their constituent monosaccharide subunits now disaccharide means that they are composed of two monosaccharide subunits which are linked together via glycosidic linkage examples include sucrose maltose and lactose which we have already discussed in detail while discussing their biomedical importance now what are oligosaccharides and what is the difference between disaccharides and oligosaccharides in disaccharides there are only two monosaccharide subunits whereas in oligosaccharides there may be 3 to 10 monosaccharide subunits and when more than 10 monosaccharide subunits are linked together via glycosidic bonds they give rise to polysaccharides now polysaccharides can be further divided into heteropolysaccharides and homopolysaccharides in ho- heteropolysaccharides the constituent monomers are different in nature whereas in homopolysaccharide there is only one type of monomer which is linked together to give rise to the homopolymer now simple sugars can also be classified on the basis of their reducing properties and by simple sugar sugars i mean monosaccharides and disaccharides now it is important to remember that all monosaccharides are reducing sugars whereas disaccharides are either reducing or non reducing in nature before moving on to reducing and non reducing sugars i would like to clarify the concept of carbonyl 
carbon atom and anomeric carbon atom. Now this figure shows the ring structure of glucose which is a monosaccharide. Now glucose is an aldose sugar that is it contains aldehyde a functional group when it is present in open chain form and in open chain form of glucose the carbon atom the first carbon atom which is attached to the functional group is termed as the carbonyl carbon atom but when the open chain form is uh, converting to the ring uh, form then an intramolecular bond is formed between the carbonyl carbon atom and carbon number 5 of glucose molecule resulting in the formation of a ring structure and in the ring structure that carbon number 1 or carbonyl carbon atom is known as the anomeric carbon atom. So in the open chain form of glucose molecule the carbon atom attached to the functional group would be termed as carbonyl carbon atom and in the ring form that carbonyl carbon atom that is carbon number one in case of glucose would be termed as anomeric carbon atom and an easy way to remember whether a sugar is reducing or not is to see whether there is a hydroxyl group attached to the anomeric carbon atom or not if a hydroxyl group is attached to the anomeric carbon atom then that sugar would be reducing in nature but if there is no hydroxyl group attached to the anomeric carbon atom then that sugar would be non-reducing in nature. Okay, what does hydroxyl group attached at the anomeric carbon atom signify? This is an example of mannose. This is the uh, anomeric carbon atom and in mannose the anomeric carbon atom is attached to a hydroxyl group. Now when this ring structure is going to convert into the open chain configuration then this anomeric carbon atom is going to convert to carbonyl carbon atom to which the aldehyde group is attached and this aldehyde group is the site where oxidation of the sugar molecule is going to take place and this oxidation of sugar molecule is going to be accompanied by a simultaneous reduction of another compound and this gives uh, this manno sugar its reducing property. The aldehyde group in the mannose is going to be oxidized accompanied by simultaneous reduction of another compound which is the basis of the reducing property of this sugar. Now in case of fructose which is a keto sugar this carbon number 2 is the anomeric carbon atom and it has hydroxyl group attached to it. Now when it is going to convert into open chain uh, uh, configuration the carbonyl carbon atom or carbon number 2 of fructose is going to contain a is going to be linked to a keto group and this keto functional group is going to be the site where oxidation of fructose will take place accompanied by simultaneous reduction of another compound and this gives fructose its reducing property. So all monosaccharides they are going to contain an aldehyde or keto functional group in their open chain forms so they are going to be reducing in nature. This is why we say that all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. So what happens in the case of disaccharides? These are the most well known examples of disaccharides sucrose, lactose and maltose. So sucrose is a non-reducing sugar whereas lactose and maltose are reducing sugars. Why is that? In sucrose one molecule of glucose is bonded to one molecule of fructose and in the glycosidic bond which is forming between th these two uh, subunits Bo, uh, anomeric carbon atom of glucose and anomeric carbon atom of fructose is participating. So there is no hydroxyl group attached at anomeric carbon atom of either subunit which means that it is a non-reducing sugar. Now what happens in the case of lactose? 
carbon number 1 of galactose is bonded to carbon number 4 of glucose and the anomeric carbon atom of this glucose molecule still has a hydroxyl group attached to it that is why lactose is reducing in nature. Now what happens in case of maltose carbon number 1 of this glucose molecule is bonded to carbon number 4 of this glucose molecule and again at the anomeric carbon atom hydroxyl group is attached which means that maltose is a reducing sugar. Sucrose is a non-reducing sugar because there are no hydroxyl group attached at the anomeric carbon atom. Lactose is a reducing sugar because there is a hydroxyl group atta attached at the anomeric carbon atom. Similarly, maltose is also a reducing agent because hydroxyl group is attached at the anomeric carbon atom. This is the end of the lecture. Hope to meet you in the next lecture.